Hi everyone and welcome back to episode, what are we at now? Number five, I think. Um, it's totally got the wrong camera on here. Let me just fix this up. All right, there we go. That's much better. Um, so today's episode, we're going to be talking all about um, cover crops, mulching and slaters, which I don't know if you've got slater problems in your garden but I certainly do so I thought we'd just talk about it I'll let you know what I'm doing how I'm overcoming that because I've got some things that are working really well in the garden so I want to share that with you but before we dive into it before we start talking about all the mulch things all the cover crops I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on the garden because a lot has happened I've like spent the whole weekend in the garden basically so I have got a lot done, so let's do a little bit of an update and I'll share my highlights of the week because I, I had quite a few highlights. I feel like I get, it was supposed to be one highlight of the week and I keep getting more and more. It's it's just that time of the year I get really excited in autumn to be able to be in the garden. So um, yeah, lots of wins happening lately in the garden compared to summer where I had basically no wins it was constantly like a struggle so uh, what did I do in the garden this weekend now that I'm thinking about it um so I did plant some little seedlings I planted some um broccoli romanesco so that's sort of like a cross between a broccoli and a cauliflower I don't know if you've heard of it before but it's really interesting to grow um they grow quite prolifically like they they get quite large you get a lot of food out of them so last winter I grew a lot of purple cauliflower which was amazing I love growing colorful vegetables in the garden especially over winter when you get a lot of greens and you can have that pop of color so I thought I would change things up this season um, and not do so many purple cauliflower. Um, and yeah, I'm going to try that one out. So I managed to get those in the garden. Um, lots of the rainbow chard seedlings that I, or seeds that I planted quite a while ago now, those are all popping up. So we've got lots of rainbow chard in the garden and pink ones, which are my favorite. So I had lots of yellow ones in there already, but I was hoping to to get some pink ones but my seeds are all mixed so um I didn't know what I was going to get but I have got some pink ones some orange ones um yellow ones that I've managed to keep alive over summer I don't know how but they're still there <laughs> they're still alive um although they were looking very sad I cut them back uh what else is going on there, there are so many white cucumbers I'm harvesting so many white cucumbers at the moment uh, pollinating my bottle gourds. I'm getting more bottle gourds. Um, what else? I also did get a few newbies recently. I can't remember if I shared them last week or not, but I did get the tiger striped fig. Um, I think I did share that last week, but this week I got a guava. So I I got really re-inspired after filming my fruit tree tour on YouTube and I went down this rabbit hole of fruit trees and guavas are my favorite so I was just looking up all the different varieties of guavas and there's so many so many that we can't get here in WA but um, there are more than what I have so I did manage to pick up a new guava for the family and that I don't actually know the variety of that I think it is a I'm going to say I think it's like a, tai, a, a Taiwan or like a Southeast Asian. It's a really large one and kind of bumpy skin, but like, like huge, like bigger than a pear um, and white inside. So I'm really excited about that. I don't have any more room for guavas though, surely. They're quite big trees. So I would love to carry on my collection by learning to graft and putting some different grafts on the guavas. So that's my next level thing because I am going to run out of space but I'm not ready to give up my guava collection I want to continue to collect guavas so I'm going to try out some multi-grafting we'll see how that goes I always love an experiment and that is something that I'm going to start doing 
I'll start with the trees that I have at the moment so I can just practice on those. And then eventually I might be able to get some new variety um, cuttings to try and graft onto the ones that I've already got going. So that will be fun. Um, what else? I've just been cooking a lot of weird things from the garden. Um, obviously the bottle gourd is something new to me. So I've been testing out lots of recipes with that. And that was fun. I still have heaps in the fridge. So I'm going to try and preserve some of that as well because they're huge. And you get so many on a plant that I want to figure out some ways that I can preserve it and keep it to use throughout the year because there's no way I can be eating all of this bottle gourd all at once. As much as it's delicious, it's very much like a zucchini. Um, surely there's things that I can do. So I'm going to look at testing that out maybe tomorrow. Some um, dehydrating. I love a dehydrator, so why not try that out? Um, but in today's episode, we are going to be doing a plant of the week as well, just like we've done every other week. And I actually picked one from the garden show to show you. So this week's plant of the week is the Queensland arrowroot or canna edulis. So it is similar to a canna plant, but it is not a canna like the ornamental cannas that you often see in the garden. So it is different. It um, has beautiful leaves just like the canna and it looks really tropical and lush in the garden. And over summer, it was the most vibrant green lush looking thing in the garden when everything else was looking <laughs> very crispy uh, and brown. Uh, the canna was looking beautiful. So not only does it look ornamental and beautiful, but you can actually eat it. So I harvested this one here to show you guys. Um, it grows really large rhizomes under the ground. So this is what it looks like under the ground and uh, has little side shoots off here. So it repopulates really easily and you can just repop break off this once it sends a shoot and pop it somewhere else in the garden. And that's what I've been doing. So I haven't been eating a lot of these because I have been repopulating them throughout the garden and popping them all through my uh, food forest style garden. And um, but now that I'm getting a lot more, I'm, I'm going to start testing out these. So I did try this in the green curry recipe on my latest video. So if you haven't watched that, you can check that out. I did pop this in a green curry. So it is similar to a potato. It was like a perennial version of a potato. So something that I love is perennials, things that grow all year round without me having to do anything and things that repopulate and grow more without me having to plant them is another win. So I love that this just multiplies by itself and does its own thing. Uh, and the texture was really similar to a potato when I put it in the curry. It was firm and it absorbed all the flavor that the curry had. So there's lots more recipes I want to test out with this. The shoots are also edible, so you can eat the young leaves on this or the shoots. That's something that I need to test out lots more as well. I have popped them in a few things, but I couldn't really distinguish them between everything else I threw in there. So, um, yeah, more to test out on this. But the other great thing is that you can make flour out of it. You can use it for starch. Um, it also makes a really good chop and drop. So it produces a lot of leaves and it handles being cut back really well. So you can cut it back and use that as mulch in the garden. It's going to add nutrients into your garden as well. So that's a, another reason that I love having it in my food forest style garden. I can chop that back and pop more nutrients back into the garden, like just lay it where it is. Um, it's, it's a middle layer. So it's, it's good because it's, it, above my ground covers it's but it's in between my fruit trees so my fruit trees are above it so it grows really well in shady shade or sun it also handles frosts and also handles the heat quite well it does droop down a little bit when it gets dry or hot but as soon as I water it it bounces back and it looks amazing again so it's really hardy um yeah, and that's my plant of the week, the Canna edulis or the Queensland arrowroot. Uh, an interesting perennial to have in the garden and also it looks beautiful. Um, what else have we got going on? Oh, I've got another highlight of the week that I need to share with you. And that is, I got my worm farm set up. So I got a worm farm off 
uh, marketplace for free and I ended up finding someone on Gumtree. And if you're not familiar with Gumtree, it's similar to in New Zealand, we have Trade Me. And I think in America, you it would be similar to like a Craigslist or something like that. Um, but I found a man who was selling worms and he had a massive setup. He had big baths and um, lots and lots of worms and was really knowledgeable on it. And he managed to give me a full three trays of worth of worms. So my worm farm is completely set up. I don't have to wait for them to repopulate or anything. They're ready to go. Um, so it's all set up in the garden. So that was really exciting. But he also gave me some fig cuttings. And I know I mentioned figs earlier and that I wanted to get some more fig varieties because they grow really well here in Perth. They, you know, can handle our hot, dry climate. So that's something that I wanted to explore more. And yeah, he just gave me some fig cuttings. So I was super excited about that. And also some flower bulbs. So he was so generous and it was just, you know, such a win. I was way too excited about worms, clearly. And yeah, my wor- I now have a worm farm all set up and ready to go. So that is definitely a highlight of the week of the week for me. Um, yeah, we've got lots of people tuning in. Uh, it's good to see some people from Perth as well, because we often have people from um, over east. We've got Sydney, Queensland, Melville. So just <laughs> that's not too far away. Um, where else? We've got Victoria, New Zealand, Perth, West Perth. So many different places. Do you think canna would grow in Victoria? Um, I don't see why not because it can handle the cold and it can handle the heat. I don't know how much cold it could handle, but from what I've read, it can handle frosts. So um, it could be worth giving that a go. If you've got plenty of space, um, you've got like a food forest style garden, why not give it a go? I don't know how easy it is to come by. I've was given this as a gift from someone so I I didn't actually purchase it so yeah I guess it depends on how easy you can find it but let's just jump into cover crops so the cover crops part that I wanted to discuss was more just that because I'm not I'm not an expert in cover crops I've actually to date not really done any specific cover crops but I am going to be doing some this year so I wanted to just talk about what I'm going to be doing in the garden in terms of cover crops I do have a lot of edible ground covers and those are obviously covering the soil and a cover crop Um, the sweet potato the New Zealand spinach those are all ones as well that you can chop and drop Um, my sweet potato that grows all in between my fruit trees I don't actually harvest a lot of those sweet potatoes I kind of just let it be an edible ground cover and use the leaves um, to eat. And then I'll harvest a few tubers, but I don't dig it all up. I sort of just let it die down and feed the soil. So that's basically what we wanna be doing with a cover crop, is protecting the soil so that it's not drying out. And we're farming nutrients, so bringing nutrients up from deep down. It doesn't get a lot of sun in winter, and so I don't tend to grow a whole lot in that garden. I have got some perennials in there now. I've got some artichoke, New Zealand spinach, and in summer it's my pumpkin patch. So I grow a lot of pumpkins in the summer autumn period, but over winter it's just not a really good space. It gets a lot of shade. It doesn't have very deep soil because it's on the driveway. And so this year I'm gonna be planting a cover crop. I've also noticed that it's got nematodes in the soil. So I grow a lot of rainbow chard, as most of you know. And uh, I was pulling out one of those. I don't normally pull out my plants. I sort of just cut them off at the base and let the roots um, decompose in the soil because I try not to dig uh, through my gardens. I just, you know, cut things off at the base, let those roots compost into the soil. That adds nutrients into the soil. And then once they've composted, it's sort of aerating the soil because where the roots were, there's now little air pockets in there. Um, But I did notice I had some nematodes in there. So there are some cover crops that can help with that. So choosing cover crops does depend on what you want to be doing with the garden bed, what sort of nutrients you want to be adding into there. Um, And so for me, I'm going to be probably doing a lot of mustard greens because I have found, I have read that mustard greens can help with the nematodes. So nematodes are like if you pull out a plant, like a tomato, a beet, a beetroot, um, I did rainbow chard, I pulled it out and it had little lumps 
all over the roots. Um, it kind of looks, they kind of look like little peanuts on the roots. So I'm going to be doing a big cover crop in that garden bed of mustard greens and just a whole bunch of other things. I, I'm not too sure yet what I'm going to select, but I'll let you guys know when I do that. Um, you can get pre-made mixes for cover crops. So you can get cover crops for autumn um, for the winter season and you can get cover crops for spring for the summer season. So if you've got a garden bed that you're just not going to be using for that season, it can be a good idea to plant a cover crop, sort of set and forget it makes so the weeds don't grow like you're, you're, you're smothering out the weeds you're protecting the soil because it's not open to to the sun um and then you can just chop it all back and put nutrients back into the soil for the next season that you can decide to grow you're going to have a lot more nutrients in the soil so that's what i'm planning to do with that pumpkin patch is sort of retire it for the winter put a really thick cover crop on there and just add some nutrients back into the soil and hopefully repair some of the nematode uh, issues in the soil. So I won't be, there's a few different ways that people do cover crops in some is that they till it or they cut it down at the end before it goes to um, seed just after it's flowered and cut it um, and dig it into the soil. But I won't be digging it into the soil. I'm just going to cut it off at the roots, let the roots decompose and just lay all the rest of it on top as a cover as like a mulch to feed the soil. Um, but that's something that I'm going to be doing in that garden bed. And I haven't done it to date because I have only had small gardens and you don't want to sacrifice a whole garden bed for something that you're not really going to be getting a crop from up until now. So that's sort of why I'm starting now. I now have other garden beds. I have crops that I'm going to be growing in my raised garden beds. I'm going to have crops that I'm growing in my kitchen garden. So I can kind of afford the space now to retire one of my beds and replenish it. And I may be doing that next year. I might retire another bed or something like that. But this one really doesn't get that greater sun in winter anyway. So um, it's a good idea for me to be doing that. Um, but let me know if you have been doing cover crops or anything in your gardens as well. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on was mulching, because this is a question that I do get asked quite often. What mulch do I use in the garden? And if you are on my mailing list or you do have my Tuesday tips newsletter, my um, videos, it's sent out every Tuesday. I send some tips out, not too long, not too detailed, just some Tuesday tips from the garden. And this week I did send out some tips on mulch. So I just wanted to dive a little bit deeper into that and discuss some of the different types of mulch I use, why I use them. Um, so the first one that I use is a bark mulch. It's so like a wood chip mulch and I use that on my fruit trees. That is mainly because it, when it breaks down, it has some fungal properties that the fruit trees love and it also suppresses weeds and fruit trees don't really like having weeds around the base because they have quite shallow feeder roots they don't like being disturbed so if you can suppress all the weeds uh, with a mulch for fruit trees that's a win and bark mulch does tend to do that quite well um, you do need to top it up as it breaks down so that is something to consider and um, but you can get it relatively cost effectively you can even get like free mulch if you contact your local tree services and all that sort of stuff. So um, the more trees you're growing on your property as well, the more you can probably bring that in house and start. And that's something that I would love to do next is to start turning my prunings into mulch myself because my trees are getting bigger and I want to keep my fruit trees quite small. I am in an urban property. I'm only on 720 square meters. Um, so I don't want to be having like massive trees that's going to shade out everything. So I am going to try and keep my fruit trees quite low. Um, and that means that I'm just going to be able to have more green matter, more mulch matter to put back into the garden, to feed the garden, to grow more fruit. So potentially looking at getting some sort of mulch of myself so that I can start making mulch in-house and using that material that I'm already going to be growing to replace bringing in mulch. Because that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? Like the more that we can bring things in-house, the more we're reducing the risk of 
bringing in weird things, bacterias, weeds, all of that, if we are, you know, rely on getting things, outsourcing things, which is totally normal when you're first starting out. You're going to be outsourcing a lot more, like outsourcing your compost, um, all your garden soil, because you don't have system set up to do that. But in the long term, it is like a really efficient thing to start, you know, working towards producing your own at home if you can, if you do have the space and you do have the trees and capabilities to do that. Um, so that's one of the mulches I use. And I use that on my food forest on there. Um, so I'll let you know what I use on my food forest style garden soon. Uh, the the next type of mulch that I use is a pea straw or a lupin mulch. And I use this on my raised garden beds and like my veggie gardens. And that's great because it's really easy to move around. You can just move it, pop in a little seedling. It's really lightweight. So if you do have some seeds, they can generally find their way through the mulch as, as well. Um, and it also breaks down to provide nutrients into the soil. So you do have to top it up. I generally top it up twice a year. So I'll do it, um, you know, just before, so at the end of winter, just before a spring planting. And then again, just before, so just after winter, before a spring planting, and then just before winter, um, after summer, it's usually broken down quite a lot after summer, so I can top that back up um, and get that re-mulched to, for the winter season. So because mulching not only protects from the sun, so in summer, like it stops our gardens drying out, but also it protects it from t like rain. So if you get a lot of rain and it's you know, going to wash all your nutrients away or it's going to splash bacteria from the soil up onto your plants. Having that mulch there is going to really protect them. So it protects them, but it also helps retain moisture and also helps cool them down. So like I said just before, with the fruit trees having quite shallow root systems, some of them, especially our citrus and our feijoas, they have like this fine feeder roots on the surface and they can get really hot because they're really close to the surface. So the, they're getting, you know, I don't know, but here in Perth, it's so hot. I mean, it's so hot now and it's autumn still. Um, it can help cool them down if you've got that mulch. So it's really important to just always make sure our soil is covered with something, whether that is mulch or it is a cover crop or um, like we're going to dive into shortly. We're going to talk about living mulches and um, edible ground covers. Um, there are some downsides, I guess, to the straw mulch, I mean, not the straw mulch, the pea straw or the lupin. And, um, my pea straw blows away in heavy winds. Like it ends up in one corner of the garden bed, uh, unless it's fine in the raised garden beds because they have edges. So it does tend to stay there, but in the pumpkin patch where it's much more open, I have found that my mulch has sort of zipped away. <laughs> to the corner a little bit um but you can just move it back again I mean we just get really high winds here where I am it's so windy today I wanted to film outside but it's just so windy today something that we just deal with is a lot of winds in summer and in autumn um the next one that you can use which I don't use a lot of is a straw so it's not hay. Hay is made from grass seed and straw is more like grains where they've harvested the grain and then it's just the stalks left behind that they then turn into straw bales. Um, and straw is great because it doesn't break down as quickly. It lasts a lot longer. You don't have to top it up as quickly, but it doesn't provide as much nutrients as like a lupin or a um, pea straw. And over east, they have a access to a lot of um, sugarcane mulch, which is another great one. We don't really have that here, so it's harder for us to get. So it is important. Well, it's so much more economical if you're using things that are local to you. So over east, they do have a lot of sugarcane mulch, whereas here we're more likely to be using a pea straw or a lupin mulch on our veggie patch. Um, the only thing with the straw, though, 
it is really hard to find organic stuff. So it is more likely to have pesticides or herbicides in it. And that can really affect your soil. You can end up getting um, like pesticide damage to your soil and that's going to affect your plants, stunted plants. They grow, especially our tomatoes and nightshades, they like grow really badly after they've been affected by pesticides or herbicides. Um, so that is one that is really hard to sort of track down a good version of it. Um, and also it's potentially going to have a lot more seeds in it than what we'd want. The other thing that I do is the chop and drop. So in my food forest style garden, I do a lot of chop and drop and you can actually plant things specifically to mulch the garden. So things like the Queensland arrowroot that I just spoke about, that has um, a lot of leaf matter and it grows so fast and quick that you can chop it back. It's going to grow really quickly again and you can use that to mulch the garden. Some other ones that are great is some comfrey. Comfrey is an, another one that mines minerals really deep down and then brings it to the leaves. So when you chop it off and use those leaves to either compost or um, use as chop and drop mulch, it's going to put all of the, those nutrients back into the top parts of the soil that the plants didn't have access to before because it was so deep down and their roots were shallower. So you can plant things in your garden that you might not necessarily eat, but they're going to provide nutrients, be able to help you start growing soil. And growing soil is key. It's something that people sort of don't lean into as much at the start when they start growing food, but they'll soon realize that soil is the key. If you don't have good soil, it's going to be so much harder to grow food. It's going to be um, like just a constant battle to keep things alive and keep things growing and then you're not going to get as much harvest so soil is key so we can actually start planting things that are going to help build soil and allow us to use a chop and drop method everything that comes out of that back garden that I have the food forest style garden everything comes out of there goes straight back into the garden I if I prune my mulberry and I don't use it for cuttings I just chop it up into small pieces just lay it down on top of whatever's there, like I have sweet potato there, I have nasturtiums there, I just chuck it on top. Those things are weeds. They will grow over the top of it and it will start to break down and feed the soil. So I just chuck it all in there. Um, if there's anything else that I prune back, it all goes straight back into that garden. I don't take anything out of that garden unless it's food um, and I'm eating, <laughs> I'm eating it. Um, and... Yeah, those are some of the things that I've got going in my garden. But then I also have living mulch or a living ground cover because it does the same sort of thing. It protects the soil. It helps retain moisture. Um, and naturally the leaves sort of die off, the older leaves, and those fall down into in, to add nutrients into the soil. So I've got a sweet potato. I've got the New Zealand spinach. I've got nasturtiums. And my nasturtiums and my sweet potatoes just work in harmony in that over summer, I've got all the all the um, sweet potatoes, really lush ground cover. As it starts to get cold, they'll start to, to sort of die down and then just naturally just sort of disappear. They start, leaves start falling and dying. And that's when the, there's enough light for the nasturtiums to all pop up. So you'll, I'm starting to see them pop up now and soon everywhere that was sweet potato will be nasturtium and then come spring when it starts to warm up the nasturtium will all die down again and the sweet potato will have enough light to pop up again so they just have this like harmonious relationship in my food forest style garden I do nothing I don't plant anything but I have a continuous uh, edible ground cover that protects the soil and holds so much moisture in there so that will be completely different for everyone because um, we all have different climates. But the thing is to observe, to keep an eye out on things. If you see those relationships that work really well, then that's something to keep an eye on and to maybe replicate in other areas of your garden. So I have fruit trees out the front in a row and those are just bark mulched. There's no cover crops. There's n There's no planting in between them it's just fruit tree a meter and a half fruit tree a meter and a half 
nothing else. And they have struggled. They have really struggled. They are constantly drying out. They get really hot. They, um, they are alive <laughs> and they are starting to fruit, but they have completely struggled compared to my food forest style garden. So w- w- obviously I'm going, I'm being looking at it like this is working. This is not working. I'm going to start replicating that system out the front. So I'm going to be propagating some of these Queensland arrow roots out the front, putting them in between the fruit trees. I'm going to start doing some edible ground covers and planting a lot more densely out there. Some herbs. I planted a lemon, a lime verbena. In fact, I found a lime verbena. I've got a lemon ver- verbena, but now I've got the lime. So I'm going to do a lot more interplanting out between those fruit trees. And it's something that people often say, you know, give your fruit trees room, don't overcrowd them. They don't like things being planted. But I can see from my garden, it's worked really well in that back garden. I'm going to just go ahead and replicate that in the front and plant really densely, cover the soil, have middle layers, have ground covers. I probably will lean in a lot more to the natives out the front there because it is so hot um so i am going to be looking at planting a lot more native um edibles out there or even just native flowers out there to attract uh, a lot more of our native pollinators to the garden Um, and i do get asked quite often what native plants i have and i do have quite a few um that but I do want to get more. So I have, um, I do have finger lime. I've got a blood lime. Obviously the New Zealand spinach also is called a warrigal green here. And that is something that I have quite a lot of. Um, what else do I have? I feel like I, I do have more, but I just can't think of them off the top of my head. But I do want to add a lot more natives into um, that front garden just because it's so hot. And obviously, if I can find things that love our climate, that's going to be a lot easier to grow. Um, And the other topic that I did want to touch on, and that is something that I don't know, I don't know if anyone else is having this problem, but I have this problem and it is a place in my garden that I actually have no mulch now because of this problem is so bad. Um, and I found that mulch breeds the slaters or wood lice. So if I've got mulch, I'm basically creating a slater, um, breeding ground because they love shade. They love moisture. And so in my container gardens, I've actually got no mulch at the moment. And I'm having to use a few different methods to control the slaters. So I know some people put like an orange upside down or a fruit upside down. The slaters come in there. They, you can kind of, they eat all of that. You can capture them and you can take them out of the garden. But I haven't found that worked for me. I felt like I was just breeding more slaters and um, they just come back. I mean, they're just always there. So... I, I I have this, I'll show you. So if you are just listening to this, I've got a little bit of a clip um, up on the live video of the Slaters attacking my rainbow chard. So the two rainbow chards, I, I planted all my rainbow chards at the same time. I've got one uh, encased in a little collar. So it's a little plastic pot with the bottom cut off and I use it as a barrier around the um, seedling or the seeds. And I didn't, I sort of, didn't do it on all of them. I did it on some of them, not on all of them. And as you can see, these were both planted at the same time. One is thriving in the collar. It's not getting eaten by slaters. And the other one has only two leaves left. And those two leaves are getting absolutely annihilated. I took this earlier today, but I can guarantee if I went out there right now, there would be no leaves left on that plant. It would be gone. They just demolish them. They eat them so quickly. So... What I do is I create these little collars using plastic pots or any sort of um, recycled material that you can use to sort of create a barrier around the plant's stem. I find that the slaters don't dig really deep underneath, so it only needs to be in the ground maybe an inch and above the soil a couple of inches and they can't climb up. As long as you don't have any sticks or leaves overhanging, because if you have one little stick or leaf overhanging, it acts as a ladder and they will guarantee climb that ladder into the pot and then you've just 
given them a feast in a pot and they will annihilate the whole thing. That's also happened to me a few times. Um, but yeah, those little suckers, they make a lot of damage. They also ring bark. So I found that they'll ring bark small citrus trees. They'll ring bark um, papaya, anything. If there's something delicious that they want to eat they will do that chili plants i haven't really they like onions they like anything i haven't really found anything that they haven't liked um so that's where the physical barriers work for me some of these plants will outgrow the barriers so for example the rainbow chard often is going to outgrow this so before it gets too big i will just either lift the i will lift the barrier up over the top or i before it gets too big and by that stage usually the plant's big enough that the slaters have moved on they like really young succulent plants so if they're harder and you know more robust they're older often that's when they'll stop they'll stop and leave them alone um so you can remove these collars uh they don't need to stay on there the whole time but especially when they're young or even if i'm planting seeds because i do a lot of direct sowing in the garden and seeds are like delicious for them they will absolutely um eat them so i don't yeah i don't know let me know if you've got any issues with slaters i i don't i just i can't um they eat everything um oh someone's saying they're also called a pill bug i think they do have a lot of names they they are beneficial they do act as decomposers and in the forest system they normally will break down whole trees like they are really good at breaking down dead material um branches sticks all of that they are helping with our soil but in a small urban garden or in a container garden they just run out of material and they just move on to your um delicate seedlings so yeah i found removing them doesn't help they just come back they absolutely terrorize my my gardens but um yeah we'll see but um let me see what's happening in the chat there seems like there's a lot of people on today so thank you guys for joining me if you've got any questions definitely leave them in the chat i'm gonna start answering some questions now um it's it's definitely I feel re renewed or rejuvenated for gardening at the moment, especially fruit trees. So um, I have a few left that I need to plant. So I want to plant out my Fijoa. So I think I shared this earlier, like I purchased a couple fruit trees throughout the summer, but I have not planted them in the garden because planting fruit trees in the garden in summer in Perth is basically a recipe for disaster. They will just cook, they will die, be crispy. So I've got a few that I've had on the back burner in pots whilst I was waiting for it to cool down a little bit. Um, and now I can plant them in the garden. So one of them is the Fijoa. I have a named variety, which is a Duffy with a white goose grafted on top. So I actually have two named varieties on the one plant and that is going to go out the front into in between my citrus trees potentially um the guava that i just received like bought i might put that out the front too um but i'm like also kind of want to have it in a pot i'm a bit nervous about planting it out the front because it does get very windy out there and i don't want anything to happen to it um davidson davidson plum oh my gosh i have been wanting one of those um these are some great natives. So if you guys need any inspiration, thank you so much um, for sharing this. Davidson plum, finger lime, river mint, munt tree berries, native raspberries. Um, yeah, all really good ones. Davidson plum, I have not been able to find at the moment in Perth. I have been looking. It's something that we just don't have a lot of. It does come around every now and then, but... Um, if I can find it, I will definitely be adding that to the garden. I think that would be a really interesting one to grow. Um, oh, that's so awesome that someone's having um, ecocentric homestead is having breakfast whilst we're all sort of preparing dinner. Uh, we've got New Zealand as well, which is completely 
late at night. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and finger limes. Yes. Oh my gosh. I would love more finger limes. I've got one. I've got the pink ice. Um, but there's obviously so many different varieties of finger lime. There's some really prolific growing ones. They do take quite a while. So I have had mine a while. I did get some fruit on it finally. I think I've had it for like four years. Um, but they didn't uh, they didn't hold. So I'm not going to have any finger lime fruit this year. But hopefully next year because this was the first time it actually did fruit. Um, and I do have the blood lime that the grasshopper ate. But it's coming back to life. It's fine. It should be fine. Um, oh, the pink pearl and the green crystal. Those are also really good ones. I don't. I think mine's called the pink ice. Um, the finger lime. And oh, thank you so much, Five Acre Farm. Yes, make sure you give the thumb a thumbs up for this video. And if you are listening to this as a podcast, make sure you're subscribed as well so that you can get a notification when we put out new episodes. I have had a bit of a request as well. And it's something that I want to do is a one on feed joas. So if you are growing feed joas and you'd love to have a podcast or a live episode on feed joas, let me know because they are starting to fruit. We are not very far away from harvesting feed joas here. And, um, that is something that I could talk about all day long. So we will definitely have to do one. I think it, I, I might wait until they are ready. And so we can do a sort of taste test on camera. Although I feel like that might be mean for people that aren't actually eating feed joas and they're going to just see all the feed joas. But, um, yeah, it's not far away. One of my trees is very close. The other one is a lot further away. So I'm going to have a really staggered har harvest of Fijoas this year, which is exciting. Um, where do I get comfrey from? I have seen a few different ones, so I'm not sure where in Perth you are, Bernie. But um, check out Down to Earth, Down to Earth Life, Gary and Julie, who were on the show recently. They sometimes have some comfrey plants. Um, and they go to markets every weekend. So you can kind of find out where they're at from their social media down to earth life. Also, I did see a couple plants at the, uh, Guildford nursery as well. So, um, you can also try that out, but yeah, thank you guys so much for joining me a little bit of a shorter episode today, but, um, let me know if there's anything that you want to talk about next on the podcast we'll definitely have a fee session i will have to do that because i i feel like a lot of you have reached out to me and say said that you have purchased fee from watching my videos so i think it's only fair that we dive deeper into fee as we talk about everything on growing them how to prune them how to get the most out of your fee joas and i think i might merge it in with a guava because they are often called pineapple guavas here so I do obviously have some sort of guava addiction to collecting guavas. So we might do a merged episode on guavas and fee joas. Um, but if there's any other topics that you're really keen on, definitely leave me a comment um, in either the YouTube video or if you are listening on Spotify as well. There is also a really fun feature that you can do on um, my Anchor podcast link is leave a voice message so if you've got any questions and you want to just leave a voice message you can do that as well that will be something that's really um easy an easy way to ask some questions and we might even do a QA and a session so um yeah thank you all for joining me and i will see you next next wednesday same time next week for a next in new episode um i hope you all have an amazing week and get some time into the garden and i'll see you soon